Okay, I'm going to start then. Um, my name is Sally Ann. I've got to find myself. There I am. Um, Sally Ann Spence, and I'm a farmer and an entomologist. So um, I farm with cattle and sheep over a 400 acre farm that I rent myself. And uh, I'm also an entomologist based at the Oxford Muse University Museum of Natural History. Um, so we have come to talk to you about dung beetles. So that's what today will mainly be about. But uh, there's my credentials anyway. Um, and I'm down as a dung beetle scientist. Basically, I'm a shit scientist. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here. <laughs> but that's what I do. I, I spend most of my time delving through dung, looking at dung and following dung and basically examining dung um, because that is the habitat for dung beetles. And that's exactly what I'm focused on. So here are dung beetles. We've got three groups in the UK. Um, we've got the Onthophagus, which are the true scarabs. So imagine the, the um, scarab beetles that you get on the Egyptian mummies and things like that. Uh, not the ones in the actual mummy that run around and eat you. That's a, that's a myth. It doesn't what they do at all. Um, these are the ones that we have. We're Northern Hemisphere, so we're a bit cooler up here. So our dung beetles are a little bit smaller. So you won't be seeing the giant dung beetles that you see in a lot of nature programs. All of ours are much smaller, and they're either living in the dung or under it. So you've got uh, six species of Onthophagus. You've got eight species of Geotrupids. They're the big ones. If you've got cattle and uh, horses, things like that, things that are producing an awful lot of dung, they're the ones you want because they are, are very big and can move a lot in the time scale. And then you've got the Aphodiines, and we've got 43 species of those. Come and go. Come and go. We, we still haven't actually fully qualified, uh, quantified all our species in the UK. We're still mapping our species in the UK. Um, and... Uh, we, there might be a few changes to this. The sad news is that some of the species are missing, but we're going to move on a little bit here, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, our dung beetles live in it or under it, basically, and that's because of the pressure, the food pressure just isn't there for them. If you go to somewhere like um, hot countries, like Africa, places like that, there's far more pressure for the dung. So you have dung beetles that make it into a ball and roll it away, they bury it, they lay their egg on it underground, and they've hidden it away. And a ball is obviously the best thing to move around in. Great insects, much quicker than us uh, forming the wheel. Um, and uh, basically, we don't have that in the UK at all. They live under it or in it. What they happen to do is um, they'll bury the, the dung beetles down. The dung beetles, sorry, will bury the dung down. So these are the tunnelers, the geotrupids and the onthophagus. And uh, the geotrupids can go down to a metre, and I've chased some a bit lower than that as well in really sandy soils. So it really depends on your soil. You know, if you've got bedrock chalk two inches above, below the surface of your soil, they're not going to go through that. Okay, they're literally soil based, so they're going to go down through the soil as far as it'll allow them to go. But they are incredibly strong. Um, and uh, so they'll bury their dung down, they'll make brood bowls, some of it they'll eat, and some of it they'll lay their eggs on. And it's the brood bowls that they lay their eggs on. Onthophagus is doing a similar thing, and it tends to go just straight down in, in little shafts underneath the dung and then stack the brood balls on top of each other. The Aphodiines spend most of their life cycle in the dung, not all of it, but most of it in the dung. And, um, and it, as I say, it's down to pressure. So if we think about somewhere in the tropics where there's very few mammals and an awful lot of insects and a lot of them want to eat dung, then the dung beetles there have actually adapted to have their tarsies, the little toes on the end of their feet, to cling on to the anuses of monkeys. So they're on site. So this really is food driven. The behavior is food driven. Ours are very static because they've got all the food they want and very little competition. You will find lots of other things in your dung. So loads of people say to me, I've got loads and loads of dung beetles. And the chances are they haven't. What you've actually got are this particular group here, which are hydrophiliids. There's lots of different beetles that live in your dung. And hydrophiliids are um, water scavenger beetles. And they pop in and out, make lots and lots of holes, and look as though your dung's got loads and loads of beetles in it. Um, they have got ecosystem functions. Some of the adults of the species will be eating some of the dung, and all their larvae are predatory. So that's good news for your fly, well, for you, um, but not so good news for your fly eggs and maggots and things. And then you've got the staphylinids. Um, they are a long, thin beetle. I tell people they're like ferrets because they're long and thin, zip down the holes, and they'll eat anything they can find. And then you have a clown beetle, a hysteria at the end there, which is basically a tank with jaws. So you will find lots of different beetles in the dung that aren't actually dung beetles, and therefore they're not doing the same ecosystem functions that you're after. So when you find the dung beetles, it can depend on time of day. Some of our species are day flying, some are night flying. We have species that are active all year round. We have some species that are producing two broods a year, some that are producing one brood a year. They can hold their eggs, their larvae, or their pupal stage in stasis until they get the right environmental factor. So, you know, these things are changeable. Um, and uh, the state of the dung affects them hugely. The, the dung is their habitat. 
okay? Not the whole field. The dung pat itself is their habitat. That's what they're living and breeding in. That's what they're eating. That's where they're surviving. So the dung has different stages in it. Think of your dung pat. I'm going to take you right down a little journey now, going down a bit of a wormhole on this one. But the dung pat is the habitat. You get lots of different dung types. Your animals will produce different dung according to the uh, system around them. So if they're on certain types of fodder, they'll produce different types of dung. If it's very, very wet, they'll produce sloppier dung and so on and so forth. And the dung beetles have certain preferences and certain soil likes because a lot of the life cycles in the soil as well. So they'll, you'll get different species at different places around the field, whether you've got dung on bare ground or on grass, under a tree, under a hot area, in a colder area, and so on and so forth. And then inside the dung pat, you'll have some that live all around inside the dung pat, some that prefer the dung pat on the surface where it touches the soil, some where it actually likes to be in the crust, and so on and so forth. So you want not just one species of dung beetle. The message here is you want lots of different species of dung beetle because you get them all year round, eating all the different types of dung and, and breaking it down. Um, so yes, quality of dung. Uh, if you've got a splatter of dung, it's no good for dung beetles. They don't want splatters. They can't hide away. They can't lay their eggs in it. They can't feed their larvae in it. They're completely open to predators in a splatter. So, and it dries up far too quickly for them because the adults are actually mashing up the dung and sucking the juices out and the larvae are eating the solid material. And that's how you get two stages of their development in the one pat. So um, that's what's going on there. I'm going to move on. We're whizzing a bit because we've only got a very short time to tell you a lot of information. Um, right, so why are they important? Let's get down to the real stuff. Why are they important? Why, why should I be so excited about dung beetles and get you the same? Um, first and foremost, they, they reduce pasture fouling. So pasture fouling is basically when your animals will produce dung and it stays on the surface and the other, and then they won't, the other animals, but they won't eat around their own dung, basically. Um, and you lose that amount of pasture. So at any point, you can have a third and a third and a third, which is your third of your animals that are grazing, a third that they're fouling on, and a third that they are um, trampling on. So you've only got a very small amount of grazing available, if you think about that. And if you've got the dung beetles removing that dung really, really quickly and incorporating it into the soil, you're increasing that third to a much bigger proportion, hopefully. Um, they reduce your cost by harrowing. Yes, if you harrow, you are also disturbing your dung beetles' habitat. If you harrow, you are going to disturb your dung beetles and you're going to affect their population numbers and their development and everything else. They cannot survive if they're constantly being hassled in the soil. So um, if you've got dung beetles breaking down the dung, you don't need to harrow anyway. So that's what's going on there. They reduce the parasites. Yes, they do. So dung beetles do that in two different ways. They produce a, reduce parasites like pest flies. And I've got to be very careful. I'm being recorded saying pest flies. And I've got entomologists that specialize in flies, one of which is very vocal and have me for that. Um, but basically, uh, they, they carry uh, phretic mites on them. There's various different species of phretic mites. And um, these, these mites will cling on to the dung beetles, not always um, in an adult form. There's different mites that will travel on them in a larval form and in a pupal form. They stick themselves, they glue themselves to the dung beetles. And uh, when they get to the dung, they drop off. And you can see that most of these species with your naked eye. So if you pick up a dung and open it up, you'll see a little pink um, thing running around, a little tiny mite. That's one of these phoretic mites. And what they're doing is they're looking for fly eggs and fly maggots to consume, which is great news for the dung beetle because it allows the dung beetle to have more food to rear its own young in and to eat. Because if you get flies in there first and the fly eggs hatch and they get maggots, there's no food for the dung beetles because the dung beetles will be forced to be eating the fly poo and not the animal dung, if that makes sense, yeah? So um, they reduce that. Then by actually moving that dung really quickly and incorporating it very, very quickly, they stop the life cycle of a lot of gastroenteral, gastro oh, I've said the word now. Anyway, parasites go all the way through the digestive system on a livestock. Um, and uh, when they go into the dung, they're still alive and they're going to go through another stage in their life cycle. Then they're going to migrate out of the dung into the grass and the animals are going to eat them. If the dung is removed very quickly, that stage in the life cycle is broken. And so that's another way that they can reduce the parasites. Reduce greenhouse gases. So if you're looking through your dung, as soon as it falls on the ground, it's immediately going to get a weather cap. Some days it's windy, some days it's very hot and sunny like this. You'll get that natural cap form. Once a cap forms, the dung will continue to ferment underneath unless it has the activity of the beetles and everything else, not just the dung beetles, but the other beetles as well, um, in it, moving it around. So when you go and get down and look at your dung, please do this, guys, when I finish, when you go home. Um, if you haven't got your own animals, get landowner's permission uh, and wear gloves because we don't want to move any diseases around the place. Um, but go and have a look in some dung. If you open it up and it cracks and it's a greeny color and it sort of cracks, makes a crackling noise when you open up, that's methane. 
That's what that is. Those bubbles there are methane. So, you know, by breaking down that dung really quickly, you're stopping that process as well. Um, they increase pasture fertility. Absolutely. If they're taking organic matter down to a meter up in some cases, it's going to do that. And of course, that includes the soil um, organic matter. Aeration, reduced compaction. Yes, definitely. These dung beetles, and this is a pat on my own farm. This is a cow pat. I'm very proud of my dung beetles. It's a terrible color, but there's red spots all over here. Each one of those red spots represents a tunnel that's going down nearly half a meter in that case. Now, you think that the cow is producing nine tons of dung a year, and they're going to literally dung all over the field. The whole field is going to get dung on it at some point if you've got a herd of cows out there. Um, and if you've got that going on underneath, that's quite impressive. And that will actually have a big effect on your compaction and also on your um, uh, aeration because soil has an awful lot of air in it. So that's quite important. Um, and therefore, they'll improve water quality because, of course, water is going to go in there and drain through your soils. They're mixing topsoil with subsoil. They're also mixing the fungi and the bacteria as well. Uh, and there's a lot of papers on them, on them bearing E. coli and things like that as well. Um, and then biodiversity. Absolutely. Dung beetles feed loads of things. Everything wants to eat dung beetles. Most of my contracts are going out to look at places where we can increase the dung beetles because they've just turned out something's going to eat them. So, you know, it's, they are really, really important food stuff, especially for things like bats. So we've got a bat there. There you go. Um, Rufa peas is flying around the countryside at the same time that bats are busy trying to breed. So, you know, it's a really important food source. Um, and these are, oh, that's my phretic mite. I've got to show you. There's a phretic mite. I had a lady earlier on who's been kindly told me she's been removing the mites off every dung beetle she's found. Uh, you're here. Hello. <laughs> you're not going to do it anymore. Perfectly normal. It's sort of perfectly acceptable. Um, but yeah, that's what it are. That's what they are. And they, they just hang in on the crevices and drop off. Um, so uh, what else we got to say? Yes, I think that is it for that slide. We're going to have a question and answer afterwards so you can ask me things. Um, I'm going the wrong way. So why am I here? Why am I excited about dung beetles? And why I'm desperate to tell you more about dung beetles is this. This is the IUCN report. This is the International Union of State Nature report, basically. Um, and uh, we went out for six years, myself and three, three of my colleagues, Darren Mann, Kerry, Kerry Mann, and Steve Lane. And um, we were out looking at uh, historical specimens and also today's specimens. I was cold calling farms all over the UK for six years. I want to say thank you to the farming community for that because I turned up so many drives and literally said, can I go through your dung? And nobody ever turned me away. So um, it was amazing. We clocked lots of de data. Um, but uh, the data is this. This is, this is the shocking thing. You know, that's under 50%. And um, this, is, this is a real problem now. Because if we lose our dung beetles, we're in, we're in really big trouble. You, these things don't easily breed in captivity. You can't just go and pick up dung beetles and dump them on your farm. Dung beetles and every other insect, they all have their own diseases, pathogens, and um, fungus, and things like that. You can't just pick something up, put it on your farm, and think it's going to be fine. You might actually be bringing something bad into your own population. You also can't pick them up off SSIs and places like that. You know, it's illegal. Uh, you can't just pick up dung beetles and move them around. They're very, very sensitive to soils and shades and temperatures and things like that. What you want to do is increase the dung beetles on your own farm. That's what you want to do. And that's the best way to get around it. So why is they, are they in this situation? Um, the reason, first of all, there's several reasons. And I've put the one at the top. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, the one at the top is livestock removal. Now, I always put that at the top. I don't put the chemical one at the top. I always put the livestock removal at the top. Because if you remove the livestock, you've removed the dung beetles. That is it. Full stop. End of. Okay? So there's lots of other things that affect dung beetles. But if they haven't got the habitat, you haven't got dung beetles. So livestock is really, really important. I like to see a lot of livestock in the countryside. Soil disturbance. Like I was talking earlier on, you know, a lot of their life cycle is below ground. So if you're going to disturb the soils, you're going to be opening up that life cycle and you're going to be disturbing them and they, then you will interrupt them and they will die. Um, change of land use, well, that's basically livestock removal. If you, if you put a, a something else like a golf course or something up there and remove the animals, then that's the end of it. And the problem with, with change of land use and livestock removal and things like that is not only that they lose the habitat there and then, they're losing the, the stepping stones to get around the countryside as well. Um, that it's very hard for them to keep flying. All dung beetles fly because their habitat is forever changing and they don't know where it's going to appear next. So they all fly. But they can't get around the countryside if they haven't got stepping stones as well. So um, losing 
uh, livestock and change land use is, is really powerful. I'm going to put another one in there, actually. Climate change. Climate change is having a big effect on our dung beetles, as it is many of our things. Uh, they're coming out much earlier. And if you're keeping livestock inside all through the winter and then putting it out and later on in spring, when we have those really, really hot spring sort of bleeps that you get, where everybody rushes out, gets on their shorts, put on the barbecue, has a great time, and then two days later we're all back in snow again, um, that's when the dung beetles will all emerge and they've got no food available to them. So um, we're having lots and lots of earlier and earlier emergencies. And if they haven't got the food on the ground, then it's bad news for those dung beetles. And then chemical treatments. Um, there's been an awful lot of papers published on this. I peer review papers constantly on the effect of avamectins and things on, on dung beetles. It is absolutely having a massive effect on them. Um, and we're going to go into that a little bit more in a minute with Claire. In fact, we're going to do it now, aren't we, Claire? Yeah. Yep. You ready? I'll, I'll expire over here now. It's so hot. <laughs> how long have we? How long have we been talking for? I literally went through that. Oh, smashing! Right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Claire Whittle. I'm a farm veterinary surgeon. Um, I work up in the sort of Cheshire Shropshire borders, and um, basically, I became interested in dung beetles a few years ago um, after I read about them in a book, and didn't realise that we even had dung beetles in the UK. And I certainly didn't realise that a lot of the um, drugs that I prescribe for our cattle and for our sheep had such detrimental effects on them. So it was a bit of a shock. I kind of wondered why nobody had told me. But then it turns out there's other people like Sally Ann um, and uh, Bruce Thompson, who we're going to talk about a bit today, he's a dairy farm in Ireland, and James Allen. Um, and between us, we've um, started the Dung Beetles for Farmers, um, which is an online resource. So if anyone wants more information of what we're talking about today, definitely go online, have a little bit of a look. Um, so yeah, as I said, I work mainly in dairy practice and I absolutely adore cows. So I, a lot of this does apply to sheep, but I'm really sorry if I forget to mention them. I, they are very important too. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you mainly about parasitic worms. I would really like to talk to you about all of the parasites today, but A, we don't have time. <laughs> um, but they are massively interesting. I know they do horrible things for our livestock, but if you ever get the chance to like look up the life cycle of a liver fluke, they're massively and endlessly fascinating. So yeah, they are really cool. Um, but yeah, parasitic worms. Um, so I'm going to start with wormer resistance because for me, even if you don't give a crap, again, excuse the pun, about dung beetles, then everyone should really be worried about wormer resistance. Um, so what actually is that? <laughs> so it's a bit like antibiotic resistance. And what it is, is it's the loss, I always get this wrong, but <laughs> it's the loss of sensitivity to a drug that was um, in, a, in a worm population that was previously sensitive to that drug. And effectively, it builds up over time. So a worm is said to be resistant if it survives exposure to the standard dose of a worming product. There are also no new wormers coming to market. So for the moment, we have what we have. So it's really vital that we protect what we have and we only use them when absolutely necessary because the last thing we need is a load of worm resistance on our farms um, and then problems. And you do hear occasionally of farms having to literally destock because they have such a worm resistant problem to all of the products that we have. So trying to avoid that is absolutely paramount. Um, yeah, there are, um, sorry, lost a sec. So in terms of um, worm resistance, I don't know, sorry, can you just flick through? No, go back. <laughs> sorry, guys. So what factors can actually increase the risk of resistance? So one would be the frequency of worming. So the more times that we worm, and particularly when we don't need to worm, can increase that risk of resistance, because effectively we're treating them when they don't need treating. So that every time we do that, we build up that risk of resistance. So routine worming treatments without knowing whether or not they need worming can increase that risk. Um, Underdosing as well. So if you don't kill everything or you give them a sublethal dose, it can allow them to develop resistance. And also dosing and moving. So it used to be fairly standard practice when I graduated that you would dose your animals and then you would move them to clean pasture. And it seems to make total sense. But actually what happens then is if you dose them and immediately move them to clean pasture, the only worms that are going to come out of your animal alive are the ones that are resistant to that wormer. So what we would say now is actually your best to dose your animals, probably leave them on dirty pasture for a couple of days to allow those resistant worms to breed with the sensitive worms on the pasture before moving them on to the next stage. And also blanket treatment. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we go about targeted selective therapy later on. So not treating every single animal in a group, particularly, if, again, if you don't need to because you're just going to increase that risk of resistance. And also, we should also be checking if we do have resistance on our farms. How many people do drench tests in their animals once they've treated? Oh, quite a few of you. That's really good. So uh, if everybody did that, we'd be in a much better position. So effectively... Um, 
it's if you have more than five percent of worms that aren't responsive to the treatment then you definitely have worm resistance there but unless you test for it you won't ever know so every time you drench an animal you should actually test it so depending on what product you use it'll be about seven to 14 days later but just double check that with your vet and then you can actually see whether or not you've got resistance on your farm now the reason i say to check is because sometimes you won't notice production losses until about you have until you have a population of about 50 percent resistant worms which is quite phenomenal really and once you're at that point it's really hard to bring it back and another thing I just want to say about worm resistance is people will often say to me, well, it's all right because we're getting rid of the, we've got, we're getting rid of those sheep or we're getting rid of those cattle. So the resistance goes, but it's not in your sheep or your cattle. The resistance is actually in the worms. So once it's on your farm, worm resistance is there to stay and it can be really, really difficult to reverse it. So that's just something else to bear in mind. Right. Can we switch forward? Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on today, I'm just so hot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what can you do? Um, so we've obviously heard from sally Ann about how bad some of our, um, our avermectins are for dung beetles. So how can you actually reduce your worm usage and where can you work with your vet on it? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I think there is a couple of vets in the room today. Um, so the par I don't mind saying um, that the parasite control plan in um, the red tractor health plans, for example, it's pretty poor. So um, it basically says, what wormer do you use and when? And I was very, very guilty of just saying to farmers, what wormer do you use? When do you use it? What group of animals do you use it on? And not really getting more involved than that. Now, part of that reason is because I actually don't have much control over wormer use. So you can go and buy them from trade. It's not like antibiotics, which you have to get through the vets. You can go and get them. I don't often have those conversations. So what I would ask you all to do is try and have those conversations a bit more with your vet. Um, definitely open it up to discussion because most of us want to help. Most of us want to try and reduce your use. And it's not just about what products you use. Um, I got asked a question before, actually, um, you know, what wormers are less detrimental? And yes, some of the old, so your white and your yellow wormers may be less detrimental. But I don't want you to just switch out products. I actually want you to think about how you can reduce your usage overall. Um, so flock and herd health planning is really important then. And we've actually introduced what we call integrated parasite management in our practice. So a bit like we've all been hearing about integrated pest management here with our arable farming as well. Applying that same principle to our livestock can really help. So we do, um, we go out now and do questionnaires with our farmers. So that includes everything from your grazing management right down to things like um, your attitude to risk. Now that might sound silly, but if you really want to go boot belt and braces about something, we might change up your, um, up your plan slightly. But yeah, that's really been, that's really changed how we think about worming and how we can work with you guys. So again, speak to your vets about it, get them to have those discussions with you because it's not just about switching out wormers um, or just using them less frequently because the last thing we do want is, is problems with our animals. So ultimately we still need these wormers, but we have to just use them, um, use them when necessary. Um, another thing we do is dump day. So um, we basically have one day every two weeks where farms can bring um, uh, muck samples to the practice and they get half price on that. Um, so we say it's the one day of the uh, one day of the week we're happy to take your shit. Um, <laughs> so if you drop them in on those days, that's great. Um, and then um, we can follow that up then with you. And obviously having them regularly therefore means that you can drop them off. We have them, so we have um, a stand at market as well every week. So there's always, you can drop them off there as well. And having them at um, our other sites around, around the practice really helps. Um, and also, so what I would say, is there another slide from there sorry mate oh pat that's it <laughs> so this um is um, and james came up with this he was totally proud of himself but we would go by what we call the pat principle so if we're talking about dung beetles talking about pats if we go prevention assessment and treatment in that order um so prevention so can you flick forward again for me please so how can we prevent worms and our animals? And we know as well that preventing is actually much better than treating. So if you can prevent your animals getting access to worms, they've definitely they've always show better growth rates than animals that have had worms and then been treated as a result. So there's various things that you can do here. So obviously breeding your own replacements. So animals that grow up on your farm are resistant or more resilient, I should say, to both the diseases and the parasites that are on your farms. Um, and quarantining incoming stock as well. So People sometimes forget parasites when you're talking about bringing animals onto, onto your farm if you're trying to build your herd or your flock. But actually, parasite control is really important here because it's really, really easy to bring on resistant parasites. So that could be resistant worms. It could be lungworm. If you've never had lungworm before and you bring animals on and you don't worm them on arrival, 
So quarantining them and treating them as well on arrival, as much as we go, oh, we don't want to use ivermectins, that is actually one time when it is really good to use wormers. And I would speak to your vet about which wormers to use and which products. Um, healthy livestock, obviously. So um, there are certain diseases, infectious diseases that we have um, in our animals. So things like BVD um, is causes ma basically massive immunosuppression. So if you have BVD, there are things like vaccination, which you can use in your herds, um, and that can obviously help. If they're healthy, they're much less likely to pick up infections, same as us. Nothing else going on, generally we tend to be all right. And then we've got lungworm vaccination. So lungworm is one of those things where actually I'll get a lot of people who'll say, um, well, actually we get lungworm really badly, um, but their gut worm counts are really low. And so actually what they're worming for is, lung, what is lungworm. The vaccination is brilliant. It's not been the easiest thing to get hold of this last year, for those of you who've tried. Um, but the lungworm vaccination is definitely one thing that I would always advise using if lungworm is an issue on the farm. If it's not, I wouldn't bother because they need to have they need to come across actual lungworm in order to build on that immunity that they've received from the vaccination. And then nutrition. So um, definitely with sheep on a higher plane of nutrition, so higher protein in the diet, have been shown to have less worm burden. So when they've... Um, They've actually infected them with the same amount of worms on both treatments. They used that were on a higher protein diet, actually performed a lot better. And then we've got our natural antiparasitic. So you guys will have heard things about herbal lays today, probably quite a lot. Um, but chicory um, has shown about 40% reduction in worm burden in sheep um, over various trials. Um, and also, so plantain, um, samphoin, um, trefoils as well. All of those have some benefits when it comes to sort of natural antiparasitics. Um, and then we've got longer sward length. So this is often, we often think that when cattle are grazing right down to the base of the grass, they're going to be much more likely to come into contact with, um, with worm eggs, which is actually true. Um, however, it's not necessarily true of rye grass. So a study by ADAS found that regardless of the length of the grass, you still found worm eggs throughout the horizon. So actually thinking about that as well. But yeah, longer sward length in general should mean that your animals don't have, um, don't have access to, um, to as many worm eggs and therefore aren't ingesting so many. And then we've got mixed grazing. So um, using our sheep or our cattle basically is a bit like hoovers to mop up some of the, um, some of the uh, worm burden from each other. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with fluke. So we have liver fluke in both sheep and cattle, but yeah, definitely mixing up that grazing. And then I wanted to just talk a bit about young stock paddocks because this is what I hear mostly. So people will tend to use the same young stock paddocks year on year. And this is where I think people can make quite a big difference where actually you change up your young stock paddocks because young stock effectively act as multipliers. So every worm they ingest, they multiply them up and basically they spit out a load of worms on their back end. Now, if you just have young stock on the same paddock every single year, that's just going to increase and increase and you're just going to have to worm more and more frequently. So, um, and using your adult animals, animals as hoovers can help there as well because our adults are much more resilient to worms. Actually using those adults to clear up before the young stock follow on can be quite beneficial. Thank you. Next one, please. So going back to Pat, so we've had prevention. So assessment would be the next thing. Um, so we've got um, diagnostics. So obviously fecal egg counts. There's a couple of slides here, so I'll just show you. So on the left is a lung worm um, from a sample I took last year. And um, that was the same with iodine, just to show them up. And on the right-hand side is a fecal egg count under the microscope. And it's just to show that it's not, I mean, they're bubbles. They can be quite difficult to interpret. So um, if you're unsure, um, definitely either get your vet to do it or, um, yeah, or send them off to the lab just to double check if you're doing DIY fecal egg counts. And actually, at the start of each season, I always send off my first fecal samples to the lab just to make sure I still remembered what I'm doing for the previous year. Um, so yeah, so fecal egg counts will be one. Um, so most vets will do this for you, and they can also usually do coxie counts at the same time as well. Um, and then, as I say, you can always send them straight to the lab. Um, but what I would say with fecal egg counts is don't take them in isolation. So if I go out and do fecal egg counts on a farm, I'll actually have a look at all the stock at the same time. So I'm doing things like checking for body condition. So I'll take, maybe take a body condition of 10 or 20% of the animals. I'll be looking at the animals, looking at their coats, seeing whether or not they're shiny, if they look duller compared to the last time. Is there any coughing? If we've got mucky bums? Um, and then I'll also take that alongside, um, alongside the fecal egg counts and maybe weights. So if people have weights or are weighing their animals, they can be very, very useful when it comes to deciding whether or not we're going to worm. And how to do them. So basically, I would tend to, people ask me when they start doing them. So usually about four weeks post turnout. 
And the reason for that is um, your life cycle, so what we call a pre-patent period, from when an animal ingests a worm to it coming out the back end is about three weeks. So if you were to take a sample two weeks after turnout, you'd probably get a falsely negative result. So yeah, so go start about four weeks post turnout. The sample should be representative of the group of animals. So if you have 200 heifers in a field, I don't want to get five samples. Um, but if you have 20 heifers in a field, five samples would be sufficient. And also making sure that you get samples from each field or each management group. So don't assume if you've got the same age heifers and they're split into two groups, for example, um, that they're going to be the same count on each group because they won't necessarily be depending on the management of that field in the previous years. So yeah, definitely representative of each group and as fresh as possible. I also don't need a lot, like people being me really, like sacks of shit. I don't need it. I need like 40 grams, so enough for a long worm. Like I literally get bags of the stuff. <laughs> I think people want me to get rid of it for them. Um, so yeah, 40 grams. So it's like a small pot, like a small fecal pot. That'll be absolutely sufficient. <laughs> um, and yeah, so when I say as fresh as possible, literally, if you can get them to us that day, that's, that's great. Um, or the day after. Sorry, I will. <laughs> He's just going to give you a mic because it's recorded. Best to go from multiple different sort of packs versus just one animal. Yeah, definitely. So I so, so I would say when I say get a, a representative of the group, you need at least at least ten samples from a group. So if you want a pooled sample, so yeah, so definitely if you've got if you've got sixty or seventy animals in a group get me 10 samples out of 10 different poos and ideally from two or three different sites in the same poo. I have a particular poo spoon which says poo spoon on so I don't get confused with my yogurt spoon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, effectively you just want to get a couple from each site because they just excrete slightly intermittently. So for every single pat, if you can get a couple or if you're picking them up in a glove, just pick up from a couple of different areas. Keep them separate so don't pull them yourself. And I'm not, not saying you're not capable of doing it, but we'll weigh them out in the lab unless you want to be sat in your field weighing out gram five grams of feces for every single animal. Um, we can do that for you. But yeah, individual samples and we'll pull them for you. Um, and yet yeah, fresh, so if, if, uh, really fresh or put them in the fridge literally for a couple of days. And the reason we need them fresh is because what we're looking for is the eggs. We're not looking for larvae. So the longer you leave them, effectively, the larvae will hatch out. And then again, when I look down the microscope, I won't probably see the worms. I'll just see less eggs. So again, you'll get a falsely negative result. Um, and also basically as soon as the animals poo. So the first a time, I, I've got quite good at this. Um, <laughs> but basically, if you go into a field and all the animals are lying down, as they stand up, mostly they'll shit straight away. That's what they do. They stretch and then they shit. So that's a good time to get it. Directly from their back end is another way to do it. Or if you're moving them onto fresh pasture, move them on and then you'll know within 24 hours everything on that pasture should be as fresh as possible. Um, so yeah, and as I say, we can, you can send them directly to the lab or your vets can do that for you. Um, I think, oh yeah, I've said about clinical signs. We've done weights, that's good. And yeah, I think this is another one. So most mature animals don't need worming. Um, and that's, uh, that's again, something that happens, I would say, relatively frequently, even on some of my own farms. They will still think they need to worm mature animals. Now, as long as an animal has had two grazing seasons on your farm, in theory, it should have built up enough resilience to not require worming. But people will still think that they do. Um, now, I would say... You can, you can worm egg count them and see. They probably will have a worm burden, but how affected they are by it is probably, probably remains to be seen. So yeah, I would say most mature animals on the whole do not need worming. And that's one way, again, that we could all make probably quite a significant difference. Yeah, I would say the same. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then assessment. So I've got weights on there. I know we discussed it before, but basically if, your animals, if you've got some animals in a group that aren't performing so well, Again, looking your, at your weights alongside those clinical signs, so things like your mucky bums or your coughing, et cetera, um, can be helpful. Thank you, mate. Um, oh, we've gone back. <laughs> it's all right. So treatments. Um, so the right product. So we said ivermectins are more detrimental. So can you use other products? So how many people use white and yellow wormers? And the thing with ivermectins is they're often relatively cheap. Again, so people will buy them and use them over and over again. But we probably should be mixing up what wormers we use to reduce that risk of resistance. Um, and then also as narrow spectrum as possible. So it, the, there's lots of um, combination products that are available out there, um, but I would just question as to whether or not you need to use them. So if it's the middle of summer and you have a fluke wormer combination product, chances are you probably don't need to use, they don't need to be fluked. So don't fluke them at the same time, try and just worm if you can. 
Um, and then the right amount, so I'm sorry, the right time. So yeah, just making sure they do. So we've gone through all the assessments, so the right time. So do they actually need to be treated? Um, is it the right time of year for the product that we're going to use? And the right amount. So again, I, I had a bless him. I had a farmer the other day who um, was t t basically we had a worm. His worm, his worm, a drench test failed. So it looked like he hadn't really wormed anything, and it turned out he hadn't because he's, his calibration on his dosing gun was so wrong um, that he was giving about a quarter of the dose that he thought he was supposed to be giving. Bless him. So if you go, always calibrate your dosing gun before you use them. So basically, spray. Um, if you think it's dosing 10 mil, spray it out suck it up with a syringe and make sure it is actually dosing 10 mil. So that's a really good way of, uh, yeah, well, it costs them a lot of money in the end. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the right animal. So again, can we use things like our targeted selective therapy? So if we're weighing our animals, can we avoid worming the top 10%? And then maybe next year we can move that to the top 20% performing animals and top 30%? Because the chances are the animals that are gaining weight and doing really well, again, they don't, probably don't need worming. So you can start but really relatively low. So you could just say, well, I'm just going to do it. I'll just do a few. Maybe we won't wear those few. And you'll build it up over time as your confidence grows with it. But that's a really good way of A, reducing wormer resistance, but also B, protecting our dung beetles. And then a dump paddock. So this is um, Bruce's farm on here. Um, and this is what he calls a sacrificial or a dump paddock. So when he's treating animals, he puts them in this field. Um, it's a little sacrificial paddock, and it's not sacrificial for the cows. It's sacrificial to the dung beetles. So he's keeping them on one area of his farm. He's also keeping them out of waterways. So we knew more and more that ivermectins are found in water. Um, sadly, a study in Ireland showed about 18% of, gr of groundwater had um, ivermectins in there. So, yeah, away from waterways, etc. And then everything that's treated goes there and then moves back onto, uh, onto the main farm. Um, and we've done fecal account reduction tests, I think. So yeah, that's just, again, just double checking, just making sure when you've treated something that's actually worked, you've done a drench test. Because if it's not working, there's no point in you carrying on using that product. And if you think if it's working, you probably don't need to use them anyway. Um, thank you, sally Ann. It's all right. Do you want to do Bruce or shall I? Just carry on with Bruce. So this is Bruce, um, who was hoping to be here today. And these are his slides, so I do apologize. But... So Bruce is a dairy farmer from Ireland who did a Nuffield Scholar on dung beetles. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so he basically, I mean, I can't, I can't, can answer me to resist that mitigation measures benefit the environment through the employment of grazing strategies and dung beetles. That is an absolute mouthful. But he describes himself now as a dung beetle farmer. So he do, his cows are there, but he's basically farming dung beetles. Um, and it's incredible to see what he's got there. Um, but he's got a little bit of a case study um, of how he changed and some of the money that he saved doing it as well, um, which obviously is great if you can. A um, bit about his milking herd. Um, so yeah, no wormer usage in, um, in cows since 2017. So they would uh, often routinely use um, wormer in adult cows. He's got a younger herd as well, expanding. Um, 320 cows. Uh, I've talked about his milk solids. Uh, but he will use antelmintics when they're needed. So that's the important thing. And again, that's something I really want to reiterate to you guys. One thing I hear is people people will say, oh, ivermectin, ivermectin are really bad. We shouldn't use them. We should, we can use them. We just have to be careful about when and how and uh, definitely having those conversations with your vet as well. Um, thanks, sally -Ann. Um So this is uh, Euros. So his conventional approach. So... Um, 3,857 there. So he, <laughs> he had 75 cars which had two white drenches and three poor arm wormers to cover their first year of grazing. This was his old way. His in calf heifers had two clear poor arms. So clears are our avermectins, a fly control product, and a round of white wormer. Um, and then his cows had one round of clear or white wormer mid season um, and one dry off dose <laughs> and a mid season fly control. So it costs, it obviously, um, our pest control, it actually costs us quite a lot of money, our parasite control there. Um, and then he decided, this is what he calls a targeted selective beetle-friendly approach. And you can see the difference in the price there. So we're down to 859 euros. So he intervened four times with his calves. He wormed 60%. So basically, that's what he's doing, targeted selective therapy. He's reducing the number of animals he's worming each time. And he just uses a white or a yellow drench as well. And then his in-calf heifers. Instead of going for um, your standard fly control, he went for Stockholm tar. So he's painting that on quite frequently. And also eucalyptus oil. Um, and then his lactating cows, he used, uh, now uses um, eucalyptus oil in, which he sprays on daily, um, instead of using um, a delta methane um, product. So yeah, I think that's, it's just an interesting one to look at because it gives you an idea of what you can be achieved, particularly financially as well. It's not just always about um, our lovely dung beetles. Um, Again, I could talk about it for ages, um, but there are some really good resources out there. Obviously, there's the dung beetles for farmers. 
The cows on the Scops website are brilliant. Um, worthwhile look. If you've got sheep, it will be Scops. If it's cows, it's cows. <laughs> um, and then this uh, guy in the middle is the AHDB Parasite Control Plan. Um, so this comes out annually and is a, is a really good resource. It's got all of your worming products, all of your fly treatments, flucicides, etc. on it. All of their up-to-date withdrawals, um, and then what what you can use them on. So yeah, really useful um, for looking at, at wormers that you can use and etc. Um, I think. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to pass back to Sally Ann to finish off. I think. <laughs> sorry, I'm just. I'm it's not long like enough. I'm melting. <laughs> it's not long enough time for us. We got. <laughs> we're both quite enthusiastic about this subject. Um, right, so I'm finishing off on the last one. Dung beetles for farmers. That's the uh, website. We've got loads of information on there. We want to put on some more information. Um, we're on all the social medias as well. We're all in so independent. Our mini beast mayhem, Doctor Doctor Doolittle, um, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, where we're going next is uh, we want to put more content on the website, do more stuff about surveying. There are some videos and things that you can see on there how to survey. We took some of you out earlier on to do some little bit of a quick hand search in the field as well. Um, and uh, we're doing more educational visits and things like that and funding. Funding's a big one. Uh, we are volunteers. It is a volunteer um, organization and uh, we would like to um, increase the funding side of that as well. Um, so we're always uh, looking for funding. Um, and that's it, really. I think that's, that's our last slide. Yes, questions. And hopefully they'll come in. Right, brilliant. Oh, Forrester Hands. Is it on? And, sorry, I just wanted to ask about um, sheep and worming. Um, you, you saying like moving on, on to a new pasture and, and taking a, 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 um, a scope of, of the, the poo. If, would it be, as one's not uh, worming the older sheep, uh, obviously, it's a mixed flock. Would it be better to uh, take the lambs and put them into a, a pen of some kind and then take the worm from them? Because that's the ones one's really looking at rather than the older sheep. Take the fecal egg counts from them, sorry. From yeah. lambs yeah, only, yeah. I think if not you can, the mixed. Yeah, I think if you can get... it would Ideally, you would get lambs and ewes separately because your lambs are usually going to have a much higher burden than your ewes do. And again, if you if you just get... If you, if you get uh, ewes and lambs together, it might look falsely negative for your lambs. So I would just be a bit aware, yeah, if you can get them penned off and get it separately, definitely. Good idea. Sorry, my question's about sheep as well. Um, uh, I thought the advice with sheep was to... Uh, it, keep, it keeps changing. I'm kept, uh, so... I think you can worm them. I think you might not meant to worm the top 10% and then you put them onto dirty pasture and then you put them onto clean pasture. Is that still the advice? Or is the now the advice you just don't... Do you, do you think you should only worm the ones with shitty bums really precisely? Or No, I think it's really difficult if you've got a pooled sample, but I think what you've just said is fine. So, yeah, so I would say... If your worm count's high, then yeah. yeah. If you've got weights, that can be even more beneficial. Yeah. So, but yeah, so yeah, so yeah, obviously your top 10%, but then can you increase that? You, do you feel like confident enough where they haven't needed it? Would you move to 15%? Yeah. Would you move to 20%? Um, because your 80% of your worm burden is going to be in, sorry, 20% of your, I get this wrong way around all the time. 80% of your worm burden is going to be in 20% of your animals. Does that make sense? So most of your worm burden is going to be in a very, very small number of animals. So actually the ones that are performing well, they probably don't need worming. Yeah. Um, how do you do the sacrificial thing with um, with sheep? It's much more difficult. I don't it's know. It's much more difficult. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. Okay. It's also, it's not, these aren't things, everyone won't be able to do everything. Yeah. It's just to try and give you guys some ideas of some of the things that are out there and people are trying. Yeah. The, what I like about that is Bruce, is Bruce really wants to keep, as I even mentioned, away from water sources. So they, you know, the, they will excrete it for a long time after they've been treated. It's not just at the time of treatment and they excrete it for a couple of days. It's quite a while. So if you can keep them away from water sources, definitely. Um, so yeah. With, with your sheep, what I do with mine is I'll bring the at weaning time. I'll actually bring my lambs in, and I know that's that's labour and everything else. But I actually bring them in and get them used to being fed out of troughs too, because they'll probably be replacers going back into my flock. So that'll be the time when I worm them. So time, what's the time scale and, and how, it lo how long the ivermectin stays in the sheep in the lamb? So it's <laughs> we've had this before as well, didn't we? So we had um, a question about this. 
Um, it's difficult to know exactly, and it will vary. So just like when we have antibiotics, depending on what's going on with us, um, whether we're healthy or not, whether what our nutrition is, it will take different times to excrete. But you know, the, the withdrawal time is, is 28 days potentially, but the withdrawal time doesn't necessarily stack up with how long it lasts in the animal because it's just when it reaches a point where it's it, they would class it as a min minimum level. So potentially, God knows, <laughs> it will be the answer. I don't know exactly off the top of my head and it would very much d v vary depending on product. But what I would say is the, uh, the other thing to bear in mind is how long those products last in manure. So um, I think the, there's been work done looking at FYM and f even four months after storage, you still get Daphne, I mean Daphnia are an aquatic organism, but it still has effects on Daphnia after that length of time. So it's not just how long it's surviving in an animal, it's how long it's actually surviving in the dung. So you want to say like, oh, well, worm, it, worm, it, worm in the winter when they come in, but actually if there's still those levels of uh, ivermectin in there the following spring when you're going to be using it, yeah. It's not quite as straightforward as uh, <laughs> as I'd like it to be. I, if it's a long-acting product, it's going to be long-acting in the dung. That's basically it, isn't it, really? So whilst I've been doing lots of stuff with both cattle and sheep on not worming and moving everything around, doing most of the things you've said, fly control in sheep uh, in terms of fly strike I uh, happened to read the bottom of the, the back of the bottle of the Click Extra for the first time in a while, and uh, it said it massively impacts dung beetles. Until I can breed for enough shedding, because it's a closed flock, which is now the direction I'm going to go. What do you suggest for farmers of us, or well, those of us that want to farm with shearing or with sheep that don't shed their sheep, and how on how we can reduce or use which products are better for the dung beetle? Flies are really, really hard, and this is an area I always come up against. And if anyone has any answers, I'm really keen to hear. But really difficult. There's um, there's studies showing that eucalyptus soil works absolutely brilliantly in sheep as long as you're happy to apply it four times a day. Like so, <laughs> so yeah. So it's really, really hard. But I think like obviously the self shedding. I think there's probably a genetic component in there to a certain extent as well. So for sheep that get fly strike, should we be breeding from them again potentially? I don't. It's a difficult one. I is it just I down to management? I do cut out anything yeah. that gives fly strike. Yeah, and, the, the, you know, we talk, we've only ha we haven't had these products an awfully long time. When you look back at wormers, they came in, you know, they came in, in the 60s. I mean, people would have used other things before, but there's been other things that have changed on farms. Like, we don't have the same levels of labor. There's no one, there's not seven shepherds probably in there flicking through sheep at night and looking for dirty bits of wool. Um, but, yeah, it's a really, it's a really, really tricky one, I think. Um, with cattle, when you look at fly worry, um, they, so the studies that I've done on fly worry, they say to pick out the three worst affected animals. Now, the very fact you can pick out three worst affected animals makes me think some are more affected. So like you said, your genetics, does that play a role? Um, Sally Ann will probably have some stuff to say on it. It's really hard because we have, sorry, we have native fly parasites as well. So we have fly parasites, our own fly parasites, and what their job is, is they nip the top off a nuisance fly egg, lay their own larvae inside it, and then they grow, out that, grow up that way. But they, um, so they effectively cool. kill off our, yeah, they effectively kill off our, our, our nuisance, our nuisance flies, but they are also flies. So therefore, when you treat with a uh, methrin, you effectively kill the flies, including, they're not selective, unfortunately. I, w I wish I had more answers. And if, if anyone does, please uh, let me know. It's, it's really difficult. My sheep flock, I've got um, over a couple of hundred Wil easy cares. So they're, they're not true easy cares. They're ones I've done Wilkshire horn crossed with cleans. And um, and th that was based on the fact there was no value to my wool, and uh, it was an no expenditure to have them sheared. So I uh, moved over to those because I, mean, I am in really bad fly country, and uh, my fly fly strips have been far lower, far far lower. And I'm not treating for flies at all. Uh, the rams I have to bring into a different pasture though, because the rams are really susceptible. But if I've got ewes that get strike, I'm afraid they're gone. Um, that's that because even when you cure that animal and you put it through the whole process and you got it back out in the flock you will find that she will pick up flies again because they leave like a pheromone residue and they will come back to her sorry you need a shepherd in a shepherd's hut <laughs> but he's got to chain down his shepherd's hut in case it goes missing um, but that's what you had yeah Um, thank you. Um, would you be able to tell me something? Is there a difference between moxidectin and ivermectin? We've got quite a lot of clients who are grazing, um, conservation grazing, and they're being told not to use ivermectin. Um, but for some reason, they seem to be allowed to use cydectin. Is that 
It's yeah. like, why is that? Anything ending in an actin, <laughs> I would class as an avamectin. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so avamectin is a, is a class, and then your moxidectin, your doramectin, your ivermectin, etc., all falls underneath that. Um, now, it's thought that moxidectin is the least lethal out of, so doramectin potentially being the worst and moxidectin being the least worst. I would say if you're looking for the least worst thing, <laughs> yeah, it's not great, is it? Like it's not like the like whether you use doramectin or, or moxidectin. For me, it's still yeah. It, they're 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 all still because the National Trust are, are, I do all the health planning, and they're saying we we can use moxidectin and not ivermectin, which always yeah. Seems, so I think part um, of the reason for that is it's long acting. So again, and it's again this is another reason why it's difficult sometimes because if you if you're not if you're putting animals out on conservation grazing and you're not seeing them for, you know, however long potentially. You're, you know, I know you, you see them every day to a certain extent, but if you're not actually getting them in, they're difficult to get to, they're difficult to get muck samples off. Actually giving them a long-acting worm, it seems to make sense. But what I would worry about in a conservation grazing system is that there's lots of other things that are affected by our, yeah. our, uh, our mectins, and it won't just be dung beetles. So, yeah. yeah, it's a difficult one. But again, shepherd in a hut, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the, other, the other question is we don't have anything poor on in any other class of... Until mintic anymore. Yeah, that's um, that's another. Which is a disaster. Yeah, because most of my clients want to use poor runs. Of course, it's easier. Yeah, no one um, wants to. No one wants to get in hold of cows and drenching them, do they? Really? Right. But we should really, and that is part of the reason why we use so many ivermectins. Yeah. But there is more and more. There's they sheep. In fact, sheep farmers are far far ahead of cattle in terms of worm resistance, and they've been doing things for a lot longer. But the problem, like with cattle, we are just seeing more and more resistance to ivermectins, and again for that reason, they are easy to use. They are poor on, but just. Just, I guess, what I would say is just because it's easy doesn't mean it's necessarily the right thing to do, <laughs> unfortunately. I, d I don't think we ought to lose sight that animals are going to carry a natural amount of parasites as well. I mean, you're never going to get a clean animal with no parasites, and it doesn't happen. I'm sure, you know, I hate to say it, but we're all carrying something. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, not, you're chasing a holy grail to get your animals completely devoid of parasites. So, like Claire's saying, it's, it's literally treating the, the percentage that need it and not blanket treating. That's the big thing. If you, if you blanket treat, there is no dung in that field that's not toxic. Whereas if you're selectively treating, you can run all those animals together and there's a percentage of that dung that's available to them. There is lots of research to show that dung beetles are turned off by dung that's also got this treatment in as well. They also need, um, they need to, they need to come across parasites. So, so like Sally Ann said, they, you know, a low level is not a bad thing. So what some problems I have seen on farms are where people worm so hard in the first two years of grazing that when it comes to them being adult animals and they actually go out to grass, they suddenly get this huge worm burden as adult animals. And the reason is they've been wormed so hard, they've not had the ability to build up that um, resilience to worming to, uh, to worms. So they need to come across parasites effectively in order to build that resilience. So we don't need to worm those adult animals. Yeah, breeding your own replacers, you've already said that. You know, breeding your own replacers is really important. When you go off and you buy that wonderful, you know, bunch of animals and they look fabulous and you put them back to your farm and you put them in the field and you don't look at them for a couple of weeks exactly because, you know, you're busy with everything else and you come back and that wonderful bunch of animals now look a bit ropey. And that's because they've just picked up all the parasites in your, your thing. You know, don't tell your neighbours, but ideally buy off your neighbours. Um, don't tell them you're the only people you can buy off. But uh, replacers and local animals, yeah, it does make a difference. With mob grazing, if you can mob graze your sheep as well as your cattle, um, that, of course, I think makes a big difference, especially if you're letting the stuff get mature because they're never very long in one place. And, you know, then even if they're like two or three days in, on one spot, they're never there for like two weeks. I know it's supposed to be three weeks, but I mean, it, it, it really makes a difference. Yeah, that'll break up those cycles. Yeah, definitely. If yeah. Effectively... What ha needs to happen is when you have a muck pile, a muck pile hit the floor, the eggs are all in there, and then it gets wet, and then all of the larvae then move out onto the pasture. So if your animals are no longer there to re-ingest the worms that are there, they will die out eventually. I mean, they can live you know for a long time, but yeah, moving them frequently, and also your cattle. If your cattle, like you said, are on, did you say longer grasses? Yeah, more mature grasses. Those poo poos are probably going to be better for your dung beetles as well because they're going to be a bit drier. Because like Sally Ann said, they can drown, which you know, yeah. And the dung beetles don't recognise fence lines or hedgerows or anything. <laughs> so, you know, y whether you move your animals, as so long as you're moving them, there's animals within two, like, two mile, then the dung beetles are just moving around amongst you. Hi there. Uh, just a quick question on uh, life cycles of dung beetles. Do they overwinter in a particular area or do they just burrow 
away. And what happens when, especially where pastures I've got, uh, waterlogging in winter? Is that just detrimental? Yeah, so, so the dung beetles will l enter underneath in the soil. Um, all of them will. Uh, and quite local to the dung. They're, they're very sort of localised to their habitat. Um, waterlogging is an interesting one. I've been doing a little bit of work with, with um, bumblebees on, on uh, Somerset floodplains and things like this um, because we're looking at all these, these you know, incredible invertebrates, you know, earthworms, everything, that are underneath water for so long and then it dries up and your pallets pastures are there and you go through now and it's all full of all those invertebrates. They can survive a certain amount of waterlogging. Um, they are tiny and they can have their little bubble of air and, th and they are surviving it. Um, some of them won't. It depends how long it lasts there, but certainly a couple of, you know, three, four days would be all right. And most water's gone within that time. Yeah, and actually, just one quick thing is wh when you said uh, describing worms uh, with adult livestock, you say resilience rather than resistance. To uh, just can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it's just that they built up, so uh, they've built. <laughs> They wouldn't be wholly resistant to it, basically. I guess is what I'm saying, but they have some. Res they have more resilience against them. Does that? I probably. I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> As in, it won't, doesn't mean they won't ever be affected. I would say resistant means that that there's, it's never going to happen that they could get worms again. If they get sick or something else happens, they could be more likely to pick up, you know, pick up a higher worm bed. And so I'd say the resilience rather than resistance to me is like never. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. In in terms of funding, um, I was quite interested about carbon payments in in relation to dung beetles. Do you saying if there's uh, there's mitigation of the methane from the dung being broken down, and also you're getting the uh, carbon drawn down into the pasture as well? Um, is that a route that farmers could take? Yeah, I think so. There's there's a lot of research on um, the methane. It's very much more um, Scandinavian research. We haven't got much done in the UK at the moment. Um, and uh, the looking at the carbon, there's an awful lot from um, Borneo and places like that that uh, is being published on at the moment. Again, we've got very little in the UK. Um, there's more research going on, but a lot of it's been focused on the constant anthemectin sort of thing. Um, it's certainly it's certainly part of the toolkit. Dung beetles definitely are in pasture. Um, pasture is uh, phenomenally important for sequestering carbon, and dung beetles are definitely part of that system. Definitely. I also, yeah, I mean, I think they should be. <laughs> would be yes. I, but I also think, from a biodiversity perspective, you know, we could, you know, we talk about biodiversity. People talk about things like biodiversity credits or you know that kind of thing as well. Like there's some farms where, I mean, Sally Anna has been the same. I'll go on to a lot of conventional dairies, and there might be one dung beetle in a poo hiding out somewhere. And then you'll go to other farms and there's, you know, if there's 10 or 15, 20 different species, can that be rewarded? So not just carbon, but also potentially biodiversity. They're definitely part of some dairy contracts now as well. So Arla and things like that have got dung beetles in there. You gave the case study with Bruce Thompson. Is that something that he's going to progress into? What was that, sorry? The case study with Bruce Thompson. Is Will he progress into looking for those carbon payments? You know. Yes, probably. Thanks, Bruce. I, think, yeah, I, think, yeah. I don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, I don't without asking him potentially. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if the carbon payments are available for it without, like, without Sally Ann said, like the research there. Um, but they've shown quite. Uh, was it, is it Ellie? Did Ellie do a study about? Ellie's done a lot of studies in. Uh, she's based in Borneo. Um, Dr. Ellie, actually, she's assistant professor now. Ellie Slade, Eleanor Slade. Um, she's worth looking at some of her papers because she heads up a lab in Sariac and Borneo, and they are doing an awful lot of data work on carbon. But it is tropical. So the you know the measurements are going to be different to how they are here in the northern hemisphere, um, but yeah, th there's a lot of information up there, and it is something that we need to explore more here because it's it gives, I think it gives another you know the, these insects they're part of a huge group of invertebrates in pasture that are vital to that system. They've been here since the last ice age. You know th this is a a really important part of the system. And they're doing that job all the time. And we're, we're only just beginning to quantify a lot of the things that they're doing. I mean, we've, we've only really got onto the, the case with worm, earthworms. So dung beetles are coming up and calamboda, your springtails, your myriapods. There's, there's a huge amount of invertebrates out there that we still haven't quantified what they're actually doing. But I think you'll find it's a case of not what the individual group is doing. It's what they're doing en masse. 
and and that's the that's the thing you know if you if you protect your dung so that your dung beetles are thriving you're actually in trace, you know including a massive amount of biodiversity because dung beetles affect the biodiversity above ground and below ground that's why there's such an important cornerstone species in your pasture so um, I ran out of air then. I was so excited. Um, so basically, I sound like I come back from Suffolk. Um, so basically, you want to uh, look after all those things. So if you can, if you can produce a good habitat for one keystone, quite sensitive species, then that's going to have a massive knock-on effect on all the other things. Thank you. Stop! Stop! He's literally got stop <laughs> in front of us. Thank you, everyone.